Good morning. Uh, before we get started, just a quick announcement about the food. There'll be plenty of food throughout the morning, so feel free to help yourself throughout the morning as we uh, um, get somebody in the door to, uh, to, to update all the food there. So um, apologies for uh, the delay on the food, but there'll be plenty as we go through the day. Um, so feel free to get up and, and go out and get more food as you go. Uh, it's, a pr it's a privilege and a pleasure to welcome all of you here today, uh, along with our esteemed audience joining us through the EPN YouTube live stream. I'm Tim Habb, serving as the Interim Director of the School of Environment and Natural Resources here at Ohio State. Over the past eight years, we've forged a collaborative partnership uh, with the Water Management Association of Ohio, affectionately known as WAMO, uh, the Terraqua Student Organization, and the Ohio Water Resources Center. Together, we've successfully hosted eight consecutive uh, March EPM breakfasts, persisting even through the unprecedented challenges of 2020 and 2021. Each event has been dedicated to addressing pivotal issues in water management. Water, as a resource, has the extraordinary capacity to unite communities, organizations, and even nations, while also holding the power to divide. Our focus today zeroes in on the historical and contemporary intergovernmental efforts essential for fostering an ecologically sustainable lake area. Just as we depend on water, we depend on each other. We're especially thankful in Ohio for our vibrant community of professionals dedicated to advancing sustainability within our water systems. Their commitment to fostering uh, cooperation and collaboration is truly commendable. Today, we're honored to have with us leaders from WAMO, Eugene Bragg, Sarah Saylor, Cindy Brooks, and Craig Smith, who've been instrumental in shaping this event. Our heartfelt thanks to the WAMO leadership. A special round of applause is warranted for Dr. Chris Winslow. Under his guidance as the director of Ohio Sea Grant, which is now housed within the School of Environment and Natural Resources, and in collaboration with our EPN team since last March, today's enriching program has been curated featuring an impressive lineup of speakers. In addition, as director of Ohio uh, Stone Lab, Chris has been coordinating an upcoming field trip to Ohio State's research stations on South Bass and Gibraltar Islands in Lake Erie scheduled for June. Further details about this exciting venture will be shared later in the program. For our online audience tuning in through YouTube, please refer to the link being shared in the chat by Molly Bean. This digital brochure offers comprehensive information about our distinguished speakers, including their headshots and professional biographies. For those in attendance, you'll find a QR code at your table linking to the same brochure. I encourage you to scan this QR code with your mobile devices to access uh, the event agenda, speaker bios, and a list of our generous sponsors. Paper copies of the program are also available for sharing at your tables. Thanks to the support from various uh, Ohio State entities, the ODNR Division of Wildlife, and our sponsors, students have been able to register at a reduced rate. This support not only facilitates student participation at a lower cost, but also extends our reach to a broader uh, live audience through digital means. To our YouTube viewers, please feel free to engage with us by posting your comments, thoughts, and questions in the chat throughout this morning's program. Our team will be monitoring these interactions and will be taking questions from our in-person audience after 9.15. This breakfast has been designated by the university as an official zero waste event. We kindly ask that you observe the signage around the room and in the hallway, particularly to the left near the entrance, for guidance on composting food items and sorting waste into re uh, recycling or landfill bins as we conclude our event. Further instructions will be provided towards the end of our program regarding the return of your scarlet colored reusable dining ware, a distinctive feature aimed at enhancing our zero waste efforts. Now let's commence with today's program. For over two decades, I've had the opportunity to uh, collaborate with uni university researchers on projects focused on environmental stewardship of Lake Erie, including a significant Ohio Sea Grant project funded, uh, Ohio Sea Grant funded research project initiated 22 years ago, aimed at assessing the spatial and uh, temporal benefits of recreational boating and angling in the Lake Erie Basin. Subsequent work with Dr. Alina Irwin and Ohio Sea Grant involved uh, experiments and agent-based models to delve into the deeper dynamics of recreation and tourism in the Lake Erie region. I've highlighted several exemplary organizations within our state that are dedicated to addressing water management issues. In a moment, we'll hear from the Ohio Water Resources Center. Additionally, later in the program, we'll welcome representatives from Ohio State's College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences and the Sustainability Institute including Heather Raymond and Kate Barter, who will share their insights while wearing multiple organizational hats. 
As previously mentioned, the presence of today's distinguished panel, spearheaded by Chris Winslow's diligent efforts in coordination with the EPN, merits our gratitude. Please refer to the program brochure for detailed bios of Chris and our featured panelists. Before we dive into our discussions, Dr. John Leonard will take the podium uh, to announce the Great Lakes uh, Renew Project, an exciting initiative awarded by the U.S. National Science Foundation. This project aims to develop innovative methods for extracting valuable minerals and removing toxic forever chemicals from our wastewater in the Great Lakes region, a topic highly relevant to today's focus. Please welcome up John. Morning, thank you very much, Tim, for that uh, introduction. So those of you who don't know me, I'm John Lenhart. I'm one of the two co-directors at High Water Resources Center. I'm also a professor in the Department of Civil Environmental Geodetic Engineering. And as Tim indicated, I'm here today to uh, make a brief announcement about a new research partnership that was recently awarded by the National Science Foundation. So this is a Great Lakes Water Innovation Engine. Um, but those who are involved like to call it Great Lakes Renew, but for branding purposes, NSF doesn't want us to do that. They want us to call it a water innova or an innovation engine. Um, so as Tim indicated, the, the idea um, focus of this is to re-envision wastewater as a resource. And so the emphasis will be on resource recovery, energy recovery from different wastewater types and sources. And so as noted here, um, wastewater can be a source of energy. I think we all know the nutrient content of our different wastewater sources, so if we can identify ways to more selectively and efficiently remove nutrients from wastewater, that would be a gain. And there's also a lot of wastewaters that have different critical minerals, such as lithium or rare earth elements, so trying to recover those as well is very important. And let me see here. Yes. And in order to do this, we have assembled a vast array of partners on this project from universities such as Ohio State, as well as other universities such as Purdue and Northwestern, um, workforce development, industry partners, utility partners, investors, um, innovation hubs. So all of these are critical in order to make sure that we can take the research ideas that uh, those of us in an academic setting have take those into commercialization application, then train the workforce to actually utilize that, um, which is the whole idea of these innovation engines. So the whole effort is being organized or led by a nonprofit water innovation hub out of Chicago called Current in conjunction with Argonne National Lab and University of Chicago. The um, initial funding is $15 million over two years. Uh, how that's actually gonna be divvied out is still TBD, um, but uh, there are 10 of these that were initially awarded by the National Science Foundation. National Science Foundation is not going to continue funding for all of those, so it's incumbent upon us as a group and maybe you all out there as potential partners to make sure that our effort is successful over these first two years so that we can secure up to $160 million in follow-on funding. Our initial research thrusts um, are noted there in terms of trying to get at our, our initial goals. So we're looking at trying to develop new and selective approaches to recover our um, critical minerals, nutrients of interest, processes to incorporate those new materials or processes or technologies, and then simulation methods and sensor um, sensing methods in order to optimize those processes. Um, and so as part of this whole effort, there will be an annual request for proposals for new projects that are aligned with these research interests as well as research interests that evolve in the future. Um, as the Ohio State lead, I'll be sort of trying to shepherd some of those. And so if you're interested in learning more about this effort or interested in trying to understand how you can be involved, um, please reach out to me. I had had my email on the first slide, so it's linhart.49. If you don't know me, um, I can't unfortunately hang out much this morning because I have to run off to a class. But, um, um, but reach out, let me know if you have any questions. I guess at this point in time, I'm gonna introduce uh, Chris Winslow, as I think you all know, is the director of Ohio Sea Grant Stone Lab. What a great turn, am I in trouble, Joe? We good, Whew, good, all right. 
Thanks, what a great turnout. This is fantastic. Um, you'll get to spend five or six minutes here with me just kind of level setting what we're going to chat about today, but it's critically important before we get going that we recognize that Ohio State occupies the ancestral and contemporary lands. And I'm sorry that I have to read this. I'm still trying to me memorize. Of the Shawnee, Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, Ojibwe, and many more indigenous peoples. Um, the university resides on land ceded in the 19, or 1795 Treaty of Greenville. But more importantly than that land acknowledgement, what Ohio Seeger and Stone Lab have been trying to do is following the words of a friend of mine, Henry Lickers, that was a commissioner for the IJC. And really what we need to think about, rather than just saying these tribal names, is to recognize what, what we're doing here. We are visitors on this land, and what Henry told me is that when you go to visit anybody, as we all do over maybe the holidays, you bring gifts. And what Henry told me is that one of those things that happened was the males would bring tobacco as an offering to other males of that visiting tribe or resident tribe. The females would bring water as a sign of life. But also, there would often be a transfer of a tapestry, so the tribe coming to those lands to bring a, tra a tapestry. And so what I've done after talking to Henry, I don't have access to tapestries. I'm not a very handy individual. Um, but Henry said the point is to, to, as you visit lands, is to bring a gift that represents you, but also where you're visiting. And so hopefully you can see at the front of the stage, we have a tapestry representing the Great Lakes. And so I just want to pause and think about where we are. Just reading off tribal names is not enough, but recognizing that we are visitors here and that collaborative working together is, is critically important. Um, so I'm hoping by the end of today, um, my major goals here are really to make sure that, that you all fully understand the roles of the, the programs that are here today. We have some amazing, impactful, influential programs in the room. I do want you to learn about some of the successes. Oftentimes we talk about Lake Erie and some of its ills, but there's been a lot of wins out there, and I want to talk about some of those wins and, and the collaboration and coordination that were required to accomplish that. I also want you to get a glimpse into the future. We do have issues that are right around the corner, and we still have things that we've known about <laughs> that are issues for 50 years that we're still working to resolve. Um, I also want you to understand, and, and hopefully you'll see it today, the speakers we have today are, are, are very, um, not only intelligent individuals, but they're amazing at collaboration and, and communication. And so what I want you to be able to walk away with today is to know that the agencies and, and even the academics that are trying to, to restore and protect those Great Lakes really do truly get along with each other, and there's a great, strong relationship there. So I'm going to jump into just some facts for those of you that are more maybe landlocked and you spend a lot of your time here in the Columbus area to give you a glimpse into the Great Lakes that we get to, to play and work in regularly. Many of you already know it's the largest surface freshwater source, so 94,000 square miles, six quadrillion gallons. I don't even know how to write that number on a piece of paper. Um, you've probably heard that it's 20% of the world's surface freshwater, but it's 90% of the world's surface freshwater in the United States. Very biologically productive, 3,500 plant and animal species um, in the Great Lakes, many of them endemic. They're, it's the only place you're going to find those organisms. Shapes our weather. We've all seen pictures of buffalo, and, and we sometimes go skiing in New York. Um, we have lake effect. If you read the literature, somewhere between five or six places in the planet have a body of water that actually can affect the um, fresh water that can affect the weather that Lake Erie and the Great Lakes do. So Lake Erie is near and dear to my heart. That's where Stone Lab is located, where a lot of our work happens. Um, it is the smallest of the five Great Lakes, but it's mighty. I'll tell you, it's mighty. Um, only average depth of 62 feet, uh, max depth of 210. To put that in perspective, the other four Great Lakes range from 750 feet deep to 1,300 feet deep. So it is a warm, shallow system. Um, 241 miles basically east to west for all intents and purposes, and 57 miles north, north to south. The shoreline, if you were to drive in a straight line, would take us basically to Daytona, Daytona Beach, Florida, from here in Cleveland. So right, roughly 870 miles of coastline. The other thing I wanted to highlight before we um, move on is, is the economic and cultural significance of the Great Lakes. Um, so if you didn't know, if you look at the watershed of the Great Lakes, it is a six trillion regional economy. And so if you took that and, and classified it as a country, it would rank third behind the U.S. and China and just before Germany and Japan. So six trillion in regional economy. Uh, drinking water for 40 million people, jobs galore. Um, Lake Erie, for example, of the eight of 88 counties that touch um, Lake Erie, it's about 30% of all tourism revenues. 
So eight of 88 counties driving 30% of the state's tourism revenue. Um, and actually for us, about a little over 30%, 33, 34% of the population lives in that Lake Erie watershed. Again, eight of 88 counties. Um, what I will share is also that you'll note in Lake Erie specifically, it's shared by five states and two countries. And so what that's gonna highlight for us, and you'll see in our conversations today, is that the decisions that maybe Ohio makes on how they wanna manage that resource can't be done in isolation. We've got four other states and another country um, to interact with. As we, as we share the governance and management of this system, um, as we make sure we share the research findings that we have, and again, I'll try and drive this point home, is communicating that research. Um, many of us in the room are academics, and we gotta remember that the language we speak isn't often the language that the folks that need to know our information speak, whether that's elected officials, um, residents. Um, so we need to make sure that we're doing a, a, a good job of, of translating the science that we all do. Um, and the last thing I, I really wanted to highlight as we move on to uh, our panel discussion here is just to highlight the, Cle uh, the Clean Water Act, 1972, but also the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. So as these programs come up and talk about the work they do, we're all really adhering and bound by the Clean Water Act. And many of you know that basically established kind of the, the structure for regulating discharge of pollutants, but it also helped us set standards for what that water quality should look like. And then for us, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement is an agreement between the US and Canada, and this provides the framework where we can kind of identify priorities in the lakes, but then also implement actions. And so within that Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, there are what are called annexes. And I bring that up for you because there are 10 of them. And those 10, an 10 annexes, I would argue, encompass all of the issues and concerns that we have on the Great Lakes right now. So things like climate change, invasive species, the influx of nutrients into that system. So I just wanna say, as, as these programs come up and talk about what they do and answer some questions um, for me as the moderator today, but also some that will get online, know that it is a collaborative and fun group to work with, but also that we have these two amazing documents, um, the Clean Water Act and the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement that help guide the decisions and the efforts that we put forward. So with that, I'm gonna call up our, our panelists today and, and start us off. So um, first I'll call up Heather Sturrett, who is the director for the IJC, or the International Junk Commissions. Next I'll call Erica Jensen, who's the executive director of the Great Lakes Commission. So one of the other two of three commissions we have. Teresa, Teresa Seidel, who's the director of the Great Lakes National Program Office for the US EPA. Fairly new in Teresa's job, started in 2023. So happy to have Teresa on board. Josh Griffin is coming to us. He's an environmental manager with Ohio EPA. And then last, but surely not least, my friend Eric Soss, who is the H2O Ohio Wetland Initiative Program Manager with the ODNR. If everybody could join me in giving a round of applause to this amazing panel. And I say amazing, this is, it, it's awesome. These are friendly faces. I love this group. This is a friendly group. Um, so if they all lived in town, I'm sure we'd be having potlucks together and sharing drives for our children to school. This is a, this is a fun crew. So I've got a slide up here first for, for Heather. So the, again, director for the International Joint Commission. And so we're, every, every one of our panelists is gonna take about five minutes with this slide behind them to talk about themselves and their, and their, and their program. And then we'll get into some questions. So Heather, to you. Thank you, Chris. Can everybody hear me okay? Just wanna test the mics right off the bat. So first and foremost, thank you so much to the Ohio State and the School of the Environment and Natural Resources for the opportunity for us to speak today. We're, we're delighted to be here. I'm Heather Starrett. I'm the Great Lakes Regional Office Director for the International Joint Commission. And um, maybe just a little bit about myself personally. Um, I have been working here in the Great Lakes for several decades, I will not date myself. <laughs> um, but I will simply share this collage of photos to say that um, Lake Erie is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I love all five Great Lakes equally, but I've spent a lot of time here in Ohio specifically, um, moving left and down and then to the middle and to, to the right. You'll see that um, these are photos from, not from my IJC background. Uh, I, I got started working with NOAA um, over 
22 years ago, <laughs> plus a couple years. Um, and these are photos from a lot of the on-site coastal resilience, uh, coastal project work that we engaged in. Um, I'm happy to say I have my pin on today from Old Moiman Creek National Estuarine Research Reserve, which I've visited many, many times. Um, have canoed the shorelines of what is a truly unique closed river system. Um, and if you haven't been out there when that river system actually closes at the mouth, it's something to behold. The whole um, chemistry of that lake or of that river system and the embayments there changes during certain seasons. And so I would encourage you, if you haven't visited that research uh, site, you should. Um, spent a lot of time working on things like living shorelines, right? Um, most of our uh, shorelines across the Great Lakes are hard um, armored. It's true. There's a hardened shoreline assessment study that folks can go and re review, um, done a few years back, uh, where we work with a lot of partners, including the Ohio Coastal Program, Scudder Mackey, he's a good friend of mine, um, where we did things like living shorelines, and we worked on uh, revetments for the very high intense storms that are now coming through uh, the coastal areas of all of our Great Lakes, but namely here in Erie, there's a lot of erosion, right? Um, there's a lot of wave energy that happens along your shorelines on Lake Erie. Um, and as a result of that, we need to approach how we deal with community resilience, how we deal with flooding, how we deal with water level changes um, in a pretty innovative way. And so we were working even 10 years ago, right? And before that even, on things like living shorelines. And then the final thing that I put up there was just, you know, some pictures of what it looks like in case you're wondering why I'm talking about rivers, why I'm talking about embayments, and why I'm talking about the Great Lakes. It's all interconnected, all interconnected. And so Lake Erie in particular, I will just say, um, we hope it's gonna be a resilient place for many, many generations to come. But the work at the International Joint Commission is very much forward focused. I have been there now for about a year and a half. Uh, we are a transboundary organization that the US and Canada had established um, basically all the way back in 1909 through a transboundary uh, agreement, Boundary Waters Treaty, you may have heard of it. Um, and it basically uh, encompasses a mandate for the International Joint Commission to serve in a very important role, and that is to help the US and Canada anytime there are disputes around water use or water quality issues across the transboundary ribbon. And so in my first introductory slide, which went by kind of quickly, maybe Chris will go back to it, but our jurisdiction actually runs all the way across the ribbon that is from the western of the United States to the eastern part of the United States and Canada. It's that transboundary ribbon, and the Great Lakes is the largest of the watersheds that we serve. Uh, my office is based in Windsor, Ontario, and I have the pleasure of working with many folks here in the room, Chris included, um, to really serve our Great Lakes water quality interests as it relates to the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, which gives us very specific mandates, and I can talk about that in just a little bit. Great, thank you for that, Heather. Next, we're gonna to go to Erica Jensen, as I mentioned again, executive director of one of the other two, three commissions, the Great Lakes Commission. Erica. Good morning, and I will second Heather in thanking uh, Chris and OSU and EPN for inviting us here this morning. Uh, my name is Erica Jensen. I'm executive director at the Great Lakes Commission. Uh, the Great Lakes Commission is an interstate compact agency. Um, so in 1955, the eight states that surround the Great Lakes signed a compact that would help them establish our agency and set forth commitments between the eight states to work together to collectively manage Great Lakes water resources. Um, and that speaks to, the compact speaks to the balance, use, conservation, and protection of those water resources. So the issues that we work on range not just from water quality and water use, but also to invasive species, habitat restoration, uh, pollution, as well as things like maritime transportation and some economic issues and agricultural issues. So we touch on a wide variety of topics. Uh, Chris mentioned 10 annexes. I would say that we do a little bit on each of those 10 areas under the Water Quality Agreement. 
uh, but really a place for the states to convene to share information, best practices, and set uh, policy recommendations. Uh, the commission is a advising and recommending body. We are not a regulatory agency. Um, so we make recommendations to our states, to the federal governments, um, and to others about uh, responsible management and use of Great Lakes water resources. I will also add that we operate bi-nationally. So in 1999, we established a declaration of partnership with the provinces of Ontario and Quebec. So they participate as associate members in our commission. Um, so we do operate bi-nationally in the work that we do. Um, a little bit of introduction of myself. Uh, I have been with the commission for nearly 18 years at this point. I actually started as a Great Lakes Sea Grant Fellow. Uh, 18 years ago um, and have spent my entire career working for the commission. Um, prior to taking over um, as executive director, I managed uh, much of our aquatic invasive species related work and I worked with several of you in this room on those issues um, for a number of years um, and it's just been um, a great pleasure to have the opportunity to work with so many different people, um, to have this opportunity to create those connections um, to facilitate collaboration and coordination to bring together scientists, academics, the private sector, managers and policymakers all working towards this goal of managing and responsibly um, taking care of this great natural resource that Chris did such a great job of describing at the beginning. So more to come, but I will stop there for now. Thank you, Erica. And we'll next go to Teresa again with the US EPA. And I love that this is one of the images you sent for us to put up. And yeah, I'll, I'll scroll through the other ones too, but please. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Teresa Seidel. I am the Great Lakes National Program Office Director um, at EPA, something that I took on in November. <laughs> Not sure quite why yet, but um, I will figure it out, I'm sure. Um, I spent 32 years working in environmental regulations, so I'm uh, a recovering regulator too, which is making it a little hard for me some days. I'm out there asking questions and people think I'm questioning them. I'm just trying to learn. Um, so if I, if I ask questions in a way that you're kind of like, whoa, um, it's me trying to take off that regulator hat. But I did spend 32 years working in every aspect of water, minus drinking water, um, in the state of Michigan. And then I also um, did 17 years in air quality. So my background is a little odd. Um, and then I also spent some time in Minnesota under the Jesse Ventura administration. Yes, <laughs> lots of stories there. Um, as an animal agricultural specialist and a legislative liaison. So my background is um, all over the place and some days I wondered what I wanted to be when I grew up and it was not um, in this field. I actually wanted to be a physical therapist and um, only because I ran track in college and blew my knee out and thought, I think I wanna do this. I hated every second of it and went back to my <laughs> roots of water. Um, and so I've spent the last 32 years working to protect the environment from a regulatory perspective. Coming over to, to the Great Lakes National Program Office at EPA, where I work with these lovely ladies all the time, um, is pretty awesome because I get to wear the white hat now instead of the black hat as a regulator. <laughs> um, I'm the one handing out the money, so I feel very much like Oprah most days of, and you get a million, and you get a million. And it's, it's strange, um, but exciting because the work we're doing at the Great Lakes National Program Office is just so phenomenal in the protection and advancement of the Great Lakes and really looking for ways to partner with all of you in this room, these folks, these folks, and, and just really working to come up with ways that we can understand what's happening in the environment and fix it so that the Great Lakes are protected. I, I grew up on uh, Lake Superior for 10 years um, as a child and then moved to Lake Michigan. Um, when I was in Michigan, I used to say that four out of the five Great Lakes prefer Michigan, um, because they do. And one of our annual things as a family was we would run, um, one day we would touch four of the five Great Lakes. So we would um, start at one spot and make sure we hit all of them um, in, in one day. Uh, it was quite the journey and a lot of fun, um, but you can cheat um, because you can go to Superior and then hit Mackinac in both sides of the, the lakes <laughs> and then run to Erie really fast. So uh, pretty awesome. But the things we do at the Great Lakes National Program Office really are trying to work to an, just advance and enhance um, what we're doing in the Great Lakes. So I'm still learning a ton um, you're going to ask me questions today, and I'm saying, good question. I'll get back to you. Um, still trying to understand what our role is and how we can enhance things. 
But I am really looking for those areas where we're going to work together to um, have strong strategies. I really have been watching what's been happening. And my team is amazing and very talented. But I've also noticed we haven't necessarily been super strategic in our work. And I think that's going to be super important as we move forward to come up with the solutions that are going to protect, um, especially in the nutrient realm. Um, you'll definitely see more questions coming around. How are we going to advance nutrient reductions in the Great Lakes, um, specifically in the Western Lake Erie Basin, Saginaw Bay, and a little bit over in Ontario? How do we do that in a strategic way that's going to generate results? Um, I feel like we are putting a lot of money out there and not necessarily getting the results. And some of that's you have to try things to figure out what works, right? Um, but I think we're starting to understand some of the things that will work. The nutrient world is definitely one that's very difficult for us to um, really grasp what will work in every location, because I don't think it's going to be a one size fits all. But I'm just excited to be here today. I'm super excited to, to meet all of you. Um, please come and chat with me. I've made a lot of new friends in the last few days. We spent a, a really fun day at a wetland yesterday, freezing, um, and getting pelted by snow, which um, was really rude. Um, Ohio was very rude to me yesterday. Uh, but it's OK. It'll be OK. But thank you for having me today. Thank you, Teresa. Next, we have Josh Griffin. If Josh looks tired, it's because he has a four-month-old at home. So he's, re he's recovering. He's trying to get through the day here. Uh, but Josh is a Lake Erie Programs Manager for Ohio EPA. Josh. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to thank Chris for for giving me that out. I was gonna get, I was gonna use it myself, so I appreciate him for, for getting that one out there for me. But um, I don't have uh, any nice, uh, wonderful images today. I didn't have a lot of time to dig through for the reasons uh, mentioned there. But um, uh, I just want to again echo the thanks for for Ohio State and everyone putting this together, uh, inviting me to be here. It's a bit of a humbling experience for me to be sitting up here on the stage with some of these folks who are. Uh, uh, you know, really uh, leading their agencies forward and, and uh, seeing myself maybe reach that point in my career where I can start to share that uh, perspective for Ohio EPA. Um, Ohio EPA uh, plays uh, a role in managing Lake Erie, uh, maybe first and foremost, as, a, as the uh, state delegated authority for the Clean Water Act. So uh, one of those key documents Chris mentioned up front, um, there we, we have, you know, uh, specific regulatory authorities to uh, manage uh, point sources of uh, pollutants going into Lake Erie uh, and a host of other Clean Water Act programs that we implement. Um, we uh, also play a, a, a bit of a role in the uh, Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement from the state's perspective. We collaborate with uh, the Ohio Lake Erie Commission to develop Ohio's domestic action plan to uh, address nutrients, uh, specifically among all the other roles of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. But that's been a big focus of my career, uh, has been nutrient management uh, in especially the Lake Erie watershed. Um, and that gets maybe to a little bit of my background, is I'm, I am may be coming at Lake Erie from a different angle that a lot of people have. Uh, you know, I didn't grow up on Lake Erie. I didn't grow up in the water. I grew up on the land. I tell people I'm a land mammal. Um, <laughs> I, I, I spend some time up at the lake, but I, I really, I grew up in rural Northwest Ohio. I grew up on a farm. Um, my brother still farms. I, I really have some deep roots in Northwest Ohio, and I see uh, that perspective giving me s some opportunities to help folks tie together uh, what's happening on the landscape with what's happening in the land. Um, and then as I learn more and more about Lake Erie, helping people who live on the land understand that what they do really does affect uh, Lake Erie. And, you know, I, I feel, uh, you know, blessed to be in this role uh, to, to help share those perspectives uh, and help connect those dots for folks uh, while working for Ohio EPA. Um, yeah. thank, you, thank you, Josh, for that. That was phenomenal. And then last but not least, we put him on the edge hoping he doesn't fall over there, but I'm watching you, Eric. I got you. <laughs> so Eric, Eric Sauce is with uh, the DNR, and more specifically, he's the H2 Ohio Wetlands Program Manager. Eric, yours. Josh, you're still an intern to me. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we, we hail from the, the same work group at uh, Ohio EPA uh, back, back in the day, uh, and it is... Really a, a pleasure to, to be sharing this stage with you this morning and, and our other distinguished uh, colleagues, more distinguished than us, I think. Um, but uh, also, this is a, a really meaningful moment for me here at the uh, OSU Environmental Professionals Network uh, breakfast. Um, 
I think it was sometime in 2019, I was sitting right over there, and the, the topic was this, this new H2 Ohio initiative, uh, and the directors of the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Ohio Environmental Protection Agency, and Ohio Department of Agriculture talking about a collaborative effort focused around water quality. And when ODNR Director Mary Mertz started talking about how we're going to really put the pedal to the floor on wetland restoration and expanding natural infrastructure to improve water quality, that was kind of a light bulb moment for me. I, I think uh, Heather Raymond was sitting over there next to me and I was like, hey, Heather, what do you, what do you think about this? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, somehow, flip forward a few pages, uh, and I, I find myself in charge of that program at, uh, at ODNR, and I, I'm really proud of, of how much progress we've made on that front. Um, somewhere between 15,000 and 16,000 acres of wetland created, restored, or enhanced since that point in time, 2019. and. We are on a roll. Uh, we're not stopping anytime soon. Um, you know, we're, we're driven with a, a passion for water quality, and uh, I think we, we look at what happened uh, in, in August of 2014 in Toledo, and that drives us every day. Uh, we, we cannot let that sort of thing happen again, and that is the, 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 the drive and the impulse behind H2 Ohio, taking action uh, to, to really improve our water quality in Ohio. Lake Erie is meaningful for me. I, I, like Josh, I didn't grow up on the lake. Uh, I'm, I'm here from, uh, I hail from central Ohio. Um, but my parents would, would drag me every spring up to uh, McGee Marsh or Sheldon Marsh, uh, Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge, uh, looking at these strange little birds that would come through every spring. And I was bored to death as a kid, but now I really appreciate uh, you know, having that, that background. and. Um, I, I, do, I do find my way up to the lake often for work and uh, every summer for, for fun. So um, thanks for, for having me today and uh, Thank you, forward to our discussion. So the panel is going to be frustrated with me because I told him I'd ask him an icebreaker question, but I think we've broken the ice already. So I'm going to dive into some of the other questions here, um, if you don't mind. Heather, I'm going to come to you first because I'm really excited. I, I get to sit on the IJC's Research Coordinating Committee, so one of the committees. There's some great stuff happening in what we're calling the Great Lakes Science Plan space. Can you talk about what that is and what that represents for the commission? Yeah, we are super excited about the work that's happening with the science plan right now, Chris, so thanks for that. And I should say, we should thank Chris. Chris has been very humble in saying that he serves on the RCC committee. He is our chair for the <laughs> RCC committee. And so without um, the generosity of, of service through our advisory boards, which we have three, by the way. I should maybe start there and say we have a water quality board who's our principal advisor under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. We have our science advisory board, of which there are two parts, a science priority committee and a research coordinating committee. And then we have um, the great fortune to leverage a health professionals advisory board, which is comprised of medical practitioners and experts um, coming in with that human health angle to the work that we do under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And I can't say, it's kind of like the trifecta of organizations built to support and advise us. It's hundreds of scientists that basically give of their time and energy um, towards advising the International Joint Commission in the work that we do, and we simply would not be what we are today without that service. So thank you very much, Chris. Um, science plan. So who in the audience can tell me how many toxic chemicals are identified annually? Just shout out a number. Anybody? Throw out a number. 47. Others? 103. Others? 140. So what if I told you that the number ranges, depending upon who you're talking to, somewhere between 500 and 20,000 new toxic chemicals identified annually that are then assessed to go on a toxic standard list? Um, the point being that 
the rate of change, the things that we are seeing happening in our region, nationally, binationally, multinationally, it is exhausting, <laughs> and it is something to keep up with. Um, we, under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, were given a role, a mandated role, to assess the government's progress, U.S. and Canada's progress under the agreement. And so every three years, we produce a report called the Triennial Assessment of Progress Report. And in that report, we report back to the governments the things that they are doing amazingly well. And you know, to our credit, all the partners on the stage are partners in that effort. Um, we have acknowledged very significant achievements and accomplishments through things like the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative in partnership with a whole bunch of others. But suffice it to say that it doesn't stop there, that these new emerging challenges and stressors, climate change being a very real and present danger, um, it is constantly a motivator for how can we do things better, di differently, be innovative. And I, I heard Teresa's comment about we haven't been very strategic. Well, I would use the word we haven't been very proactive. We are absolutely doing everything that we can, and we should continue to invest in ways that we are solving the sins of the past, right? Restoring those actions, making sure that our waterways are swimmable, fishable, drinkable. And, and this is an and statement, we need to be forward-looking. And so much of the work that the IJC is doing right now is that, it's forward-looking. The science plan is really trying to dig in on where are those unknowns, the things that we don't fully understand, the things that have been so fast changing with climate change that we are struggling with the science that we provide to keep up? There was a time when only Lake Erie had harmful algal blooms. And now we're seeing harmful algal blooms pop up in the coldest of our freshwater Great Lakes, Lake Superior, namely. That's because we're seeing more frequent storms, we're seeing the nutrients roll off the landscape, the land practices are much different, in many cases much more efficient. Um, we have to be advanced in our thinking. And so I'm gonna spend a lot of time at the end of um, when we get to the panel present or the presentations at the second part of this, this engagement, talking about the science plan, but suffice it to say, um, we're doing a lot to really think about that. What does it mean for the Great Lakes in terms of early warning systems? What does it mean for the Great Lakes in terms of evaluating human health indicators such that they can be listed in the State of Great Lakes report for these systems? What does it mean when we start to think about the fact that we have such, we have historically had such cold season weather where we can't have four season of surveillance and monitoring out on the lakes? Buoys get pulled, people can't get out on ice. What does it mean if we actually have a man made disaster? What if we have an oil spill on ice? These are all big questions that we're starting to wrangle with, and suffice it to say, we have aging workforces. We have needs to build in different perspectives, cultural perspectives, traditional eco ecological knowledge perspectives. It's not just Western science. There's so much that can be learned from our indigenous partners across this region. So the science plan is really aimed at that, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Thank you, Heather, for that. Erica, coming to you, and you hit on a little in your opening remarks, but can you talk about the commission's role kind of in that policy space? Sure, and um, just briefly, I failed to mention in my intro that uh, the commission is actually made up of appointees from each of the Great Lakes states, and uh, Director Mary Mertz of the Ohio DNR is our current chair, so I did want to make sure I mentioned <laughs> that as well. Um, but yes, um, as I mentioned, the commission, um, we're an advisory, a recommending body, um, but one of the, the strengths and things that we're able to do is um, when we're convening our states and provinces and identifying issues, um, but also identifying solutions and needs and opportunities where there's consensus, um, we are able to advocate for those policy changes, um, programs, uh, funding that supports all of the work that 
uh, folks on this stage do to some extent through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, but supports our activities in the region. So uh, we convene um, an annual statement of federal priorities. Um, so we're just back from Washington, D.C. Uh, about a week and a half ago uh, where we presented our priorities to the U.S. administration and Congress and said these are the important um, programs, policies, and funding that you should be working on that underpins the work that we do in the Great Lakes. So um, things like funding for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, um, to some of Heather's comments, making sure that our federal science programs that are doing some of the forecasting, modeling, understanding these climate changes that we're seeing, that the Great Lakes um, gets sufficient attention within those programs because we know that our region is unique and the impacts that we're going to see are unique and we want to make sure that those science programs are adequately addressing the types of modeling and forecasting um, that we need in the Great Lakes region. Um, things like um, dredging for navigation, but also recreational access. So we know along the shores of Lake Erie, we have um, commercial ports as well as recreational harbors that are important to the um, coastal communities in these areas. So making sure that we're getting um, sufficient federal resources for dredging and keeping those um, important ports and harbors open. Um, looking at programs under the Farm Bill, so um, conservation that helps support these uh, practices on the lands that can keep nutrients um, and other things on the land where we want them and out of the waterways where they can potentially contribute to these um, excess harmful algal blooms. Um, aquatic invasive species prevention and control, so continuing to fund um, and support important programs that are preventing the movement of invasive carp towards the Great Lakes region. Um, but also preventing the importation of new species into um, the U.S. and the Great Lakes region. So um, we play a very important uh, policy and advocacy role on behalf of our states um, that helps to make sure that um, Great Lakes priorities are reflected in our national policies and programs. Thank you, Erica. And I'm glad you mentioned, I mean, all of us, I think, were in D.C. two weeks ago on the Hill talking with our congressional delegation. And it's great. I, I get to walk into a lot of those offices. And I'll tell you, it doesn't matter whether it's a Republican or Democratic office. When you walk in there, they don't see a difference between a healthy environment and a healthy economy. It's impressive, the, the folks that we have in the Hill right now and their passion for the Great Lakes. It's really exciting to see. And, and the mention of that word advocacy, I always hear that and I think, is that advocacy with a capital A or with a lowercase a? And what I mean by that is lowercase a for me is we're advocating for the science, right? We're advocating for science to inform decisions and that's what this team up here on the table does very, very, very well. Teresa, coming to you and we've mentioned GLRI or Great Lakes Restoration Initiative a lot. Can you help the audience kind of understand how that, that rolls in, in your office and how you work with other agencies. And, and, and just talk about the GLRI for us, please. Absolutely. So the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and we were just in DC two weeks ago, feels like yesterday, um, <laughs> really trying to, to keep that at the forefront. I walked out of that uh, week-long session just amazed at how it really is one of those things that unites people. Everyone recognizes the importance of protecting the Great Lakes and the work that the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative does. But it's not just what happens in the Great Lakes National Program Office. There are 16 federal agencies that come together to determine how the money is going to be spent. Uh, we divvy that out between the federal agencies. And then they also then will fund projects that are at the local level, at, or we at Glimpo will f fund projects that are at the local level, state level, uh, trying to keep all the dollars moving. Everything from climate um, to tribal uh, work, that's, that's uh, super important to understanding how that all fits in uh, to the understanding of how the Great Lakes work. There is this Western base, but it's also important to understand the indigenous base. But there are other things that happen with the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative money. Um, right now it's a funding of about $370 million, just shy of that. We are looking to try and boost that to 550, which would build, build in uh, what the uh, bill money, the bipartisan infrastructure law money, has brought in an additional billion dollars, which sounds like a crazy amount of money. Um, and it is a crazy amount of money. It's not going to be enough to finish the work that needs to be done on our area of concern. It seems like it should be, but to be honest, we're all competing for the same resources right now. So as we're working on a project of dredging over in the Cuyahoga, Milwaukee is also working on a project for dredging. 
as is Detroit. And so trying to find folks who do that work, business plan model for someone, um, there is not enough contractors out there that can do this work. And so we're competing for the same resources, so all of the projects are coming in much more expensive than you would have anticipated, and a billion dollars seems like it would have fit. It's not going to. But that money is then, like I said, divvied out between the federal agencies, 16 of them, um, and then we will also uh, work, I said, work with the states. One of the other pieces of that is the development of an action plan. So right now we're in the development of Action Plan 4, so the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative Action Plan 4, which will set the base for the next five years on how we're going to work and what work we're going to focus on. In that new action plan, which will come out uh, first week of April uh, for public comment, so please do put your comments in there. It's super important. We do want the feedback. We held, I think, five sessions. They were all pre me um, across the Great Lakes, uh, getting feedback from communities on what they wanted to see in the next action plan. So that action plan will come out here, um, like I said, the first week of April. Um, the reason we were hoping to do it at the end of March, but the good news is we're going to announce um, our environmental justice uh, grants um, the last week of March. Um, we were hoping to do that this week. It's gonna be the last week of March now. Um, and that's another piece that's within the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative is really trying to work with those communities that are underserved and underprivileged and making sure we're getting funds out into the community and developing ways to give capacity and develop projects that can work in an underserved community. So those grants are gonna come out um, the end of March. Um, I hesitate to even say that because uh, the announcement was coming out of the region, it's now coming out of the White House. Um, so <laughs> all bets are off. Um, so it, it, you'll see Great Lakes Restoration Initiative um, action plan come out the week following that. But we do want the, the feedback on, on that, but that plan does set what we will do for the next five years and where we're gonna focus our energies and our projects. Obviously there are things we must do um, under that plan and the federal agencies are such a major piece of that that they too um, are very in involved in the development of the plan. And so as a result of that, you'll see that coming out hopefully the first week of April. Uh, but just the partnership is super important. You know, I, I heard the two state agency folks here talk about, you know, this esteemed group. But I'll tell you, the work happens at the local level. It doesn't happen um, at, at Glimpo. We hand out the money for you all to get the work done. It's kind of like mom telling you to clean your room. Um, <laughs> but it's so important what the states do and what the locals do is is where the work gets done. So without having those partnerships, there's no way that EPA could handle any of this work without the partnerships that come from the relationships we have with the state, the other federal agencies, and then the local NGOs. So you know, never ever underestimate what happens. I'm just here to make sure the funding gets done and that we have organ an organized approach to doing it, but the work happens with all of you. So don't ever lose fact of that. Teresa, thanks, and I love the highlight on the environmental justice because the AOCs, the areas of concern, is one of the things that US EPA works on the Glimpo GLR money, but as you restore these areas, we're always worried that you're gonna then gentrify these areas that were blighted, and so how do we make sure we have environmental justice? It's not just remediation, restoration, it's the revitalization of those communities. It's so important, and, and the gentrification piece is, is such an interesting, an interesting perspective, right? Like, we don't wanna go in and clean up a site and then the people who have lived there and, and been you know, suffering from the contamination are now moved out. That's not, that is not the goal of this at all. At the same time, it's super important to clean up those sites. So how do we merge those two together? And it really becomes a local planning and zoning yeah. issue also. And so making sure the locals are thinking about what that looks like at the end. Something you're gonna see also here, um, and I'm stealing all the thunder of my staff and they're gonna love me for that. <laughs> Sorry guys. Um, is we are adding projects to the end of some of our areas of concerns that are close to being finished because we, we recognize the importance of making sure that the people who live in that community have access back to the area so that it, it will be there forever. So we're trying to build those projects in right now um, and I'm really excited about those because it's something we hadn't thought about before. It, it, it's, it's a concept, you know, environmental justice, if, if this were easy, we would have already done it, right? It's, I have that philosophy a lot and, and we're seeing that with some of our projects, making sure we're building back in some kind of access back to the resource. So it, it's a really important point, Chris. It's fantastic, thanks. Josh, coming to you, um, I know the hat you've been wearing for many years now is working on the DMDL. So can you talk to the folks in the audience? That can kind of be a, a, an amorphous project and process. Can you kind of give folks an idea of what the TMDL and, and what you've seen happening in that space, if you could, please? Yeah. So, <clears throat> hmm. 
TMDLs are, are you know, I think I, I talked about uh, the mommy TMDL last week, and I said it, it, one of the things about TMDLs is we use a lot of jargon, and, <laughs> and that <clears throat> jargon starts with just TMDL. Uh, <laughs> total maximum daily load. It 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 really uh, encompasses a lot of uh, of work, and we use it really fluently. It just flows off of our tongue. Uh, expect people to understand what we're talking about, but really. Uh, TMDL comes down to being a, a bit of a diet for a water body is is the corollary I like to look at, you know, so um, we have a goal for a water body, you know, we establish those goals uh, with our uh, under the Clean Water Act. Uh, if it's not meeting those goals, much like I'm not meeting my goals right now, um, and I'm on a diet, uh, <laughs> we, we're working on a diet for uh, Lake Erie. Uh, and, and with the Maumee Watershed Nutrient TMDL that I worked uh, extensively on, we were working on a diet specifically for the western basin of Lake Erie and the algae and nutrient-related issues. Um, and, and with that, we identified, um, really, um, we, we put together the pieces in the context of the Clean Water Act. So much of the work that's going on in Lake Erie uh, predated our efforts to do a TMDL. Um, and, and really, it was pulling those together to, to tie all of the other work going on in Lake Erie to our Clean Water Act goals um, and, and use that maybe as a, as a, as a springboard to, to push forward uh, for additional work and, and, and efforts. So um, I think we're, we're kind of wrap that point up is, is you know, the we kind of ended that with with this plan and, and stitched together with all a lot of really the resources that uh, especially GLRI um, Eric mentioned H2 Ohio earlier um, you know all of these resources because one of the maybe unique things about uh, the Western Basin is you know it's shallow uh, it's warm um, but also it has the most agricultural land uh, largest non-point source loads of any of the Great Lakes and and that's just kind of a consequence of what it is, and it has fertile, high-quality soils, um, and tying it to the, the situation. So, you know, we're trying to, to come up with a plan to get those two things to work together better. Um, I'd probably wrap up there, I guess. I'm kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Hey, we'll get you some sleep here in a little bit. Hang tight. <laughs> Hang tight. Now we're coming to Eric, and Eric, as, as you mentioned, is with the DNR and, and in the wetland space. So, Eric, I'd just love to hear you talk about how H2 Ohio kind of manifests in your job, and can you talk to uh, the folks about what's going on in that wetland area, please? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'd like to always acknowledge that, that H2 Ohio is bigger and broader than the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. You know, that, that's, that's my lane of it. But, um, you know, we, we can't have the, the success that we need to have uh, without uh, the, the, the engagement of the agricultural community uh, in northwest, northwest Ohio and, and throughout the state of Ohio. Um, and, you know, my colleagues at the Ohio Department of Agriculture are, are doing a tremendous job uh, getting producers signed up for best management practices and incentivizing those practices across the landscape. Um, you know, specifically at, at ODNR, you know, our, our expertise is natural infrastructure. So um, we want to have uh, a restored wetland in the flow path of nutrient-laden surface water uh, wherever we can, can do that. Um, and you know, I think it's, it's important also to highlight, as we move uh, 100 miles an hour down the road with wetland restoration, we also have, have invested at the same time in monitoring the, the success of our projects and turning that feedback back into uh, actionable you know, management decisions at ODNR. Um, Want to make sure that we highlight the uh, H2 Ohio Wetland Monitoring Program and uh, shout out to the the watch party at the uh, University of Toledo right now. <laughs> um, half a dozen academic institutions that are, are working together uh, collaboratively to hold us accountable for the nutrient reductions that we're hopefully seeing on our projects, and also providing you know, some of that management guidance back to us as we have. 172 different uh, wetland restoration projects uh, across the state of Ohio right now. Which ones are performing better? What designs look more promising? What types of features do we need to accentuate or prioritize in future rounds of, of funding? Um, 
So it's that whole adaptive management type of approach that uh, I'm also very proud of uh, as, as part of our, our, our efforts. And uh, I, I do want to uh, highlight that another thing that I, I really love is the, the co-investment by H2 Ohio and GLRI. Um, on specific projects. I think that, that highlights the, the power of our collaborative approach. Uh, we have one that's wrapping up in Allen County this summer that I hope we can, can celebrate publicly. It's like a 50-50 match between Teresa's program and our program to address a flooding issue locally and improve water quality uh, in a, a Maumee River tributary. Thank you for that, Eric. And the six institutions that Eric was mentioning falls under a group called LEARN. So it's the Lake Erie and Aquatic Research Network. And so what we found as academics is that, at least in my career of the last 15 years, there's so much more cross-university collaboration than I've ever seen before, and then university to agency, whether state or federal before. And so LEARN was created to facilitate that connection. To monitor the 150 plus wetlands, one academic, one university can't do that. And so it's a shared lift. And, and I think that thread runs all the way through here, and the fact that none of the work that we're doing in, in, in the lakes, Lake Erie specifically, would be done without this communication, but as also you said, the leveraging of financial resources, too. It's all hands on deck and all money on deck here in the Great Lakes. I'm going to look over to Joe. Joe is going to now open it up, and we're going to do questions from online, and, and Joe then from the audience. So I'll turn it to you to facilitate this part, if you don't mind. Yep. Thanks, Chris. Thank and Eric, thank you for mentioning the group watching from Toledo. Um, we do have a few different live stream parties happening up in the Lake Erie watershed. So hello to those on YouTube um, watching at the various <laughs> yeah, everyone wave, hello, <laughs> Toledo and beyond. Um, thank you. So um, Jeff Reuter is watching, and he has mentioned his current service on the IJC Manure Collaborative. And uh, Jeff's question is about, is the IJC trying to spin off this group? Could you collaborate to host it? And then he mentions possibly with TNC. And I don't know which TNC acronym he's referring to, Jeff, but um, the question is about manure collab the manure collaborative. Thanks for that, Jeff. Shout out to Jeff online. Um, yes, in fact, we just released uh, the, the manure framework and um, many of the recommendations that came out of that report last year. And I will say that one of the recommendations was to continue to seek a independent collaborative sponsor that could continue to convene those groups moving forward. Um, the IJC is very much uh, committed to pursuing that as an avenue forward, but we need a sponsor. And so I would say um, I do have a meeting coming up with TNC, so perhaps that will now be on the docket. Thanks for the <laughs> suggestion, Jeff, um, in terms of, of having the conversations. You know, this might be a good time, too, to say that we are exploring um, new partnerships with the Tri Commissions. We've been in conversation with the Great Lakes Commission and the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, um, both of which uh, we have some shared interests in nutrients, certainly, um, and um, how they are processed within these systems. Um, a 40% reduction in nutrients on land in the near shore makes a lot of sense, and we have recommendations towards that end, um, working with extended producers and trying to manage that circumstance is a primary goal. Um, but I would say that there are unintended effects from recommendations like that. Our fisheries partners are very concerned about what it means to reduce uh, nutrients in the near shore versus the offshore where the food web systems for native fish depend um, very significantly upon those nutrients being available. So we need to be really careful is the bottom line here. Um, working with collaboratives that uh, bring to the table lots of different perspectives, including ag, including farmers, including folks who might be regulatory um, uh, agencies will help us get there faster, sooner, better. But it, I agree with Teresa. It is not a simple solution. There's no silver bullet, one size fits all. It's a highly complex um, series of actions that we need to put in place. And you know, my fisheries experience with NOAA, I will just share, businesses, even though they might be part of um, where we need to go in terms of finding solutions, they don't want these nutrients rolling off their systems. 
So there's gotta be a business argument, right? What's the bottom line where we can all work together and find those solutions that are implementable, that are sustained by, by the ag producers, um, and that everybody's bought into moving them forward. I think that's what a collaborative seeks to do. And so to that end, if there's any willing sponsors who would like to work with us, um, we are all ears and certainly open to those conversations. Thanks, Heather. So we have a, first off, if you have a question here in the room, just raise your hand and I'll run you a microphone. Um, another question from YouTube, and there's been a bit of a dialogue back and forth among uh, participants there about Mommy Watershed. Um, this is from Bill Hughes. What is the most impactful thing that could be done in the Mommy Watershed to reduce nutrient load? I think I, I'd like to highlight one of the ongoing efforts we have right now and, and, a, and really a core of ODA's H2 Ohio program is nutrient management planning. And, and that comes down to making sure that you're putting nutrients uh, where you need them, uh, not getting them where you don't. So, uh, I, and, I, and I think we have, a, have really ex, a, a robust voluntary nutrient management planning framework uh, building in the watershed. I think in our, our upcoming enrollment, we're looking at hopefully having uh, 50% of the acres enrolled in that program where we're really uh, working with uh, agricultural producers to, to bring them some of that technical expertise and, and resources to help them uh, implement the technology they need to make sure we're getting nutrients uh, where they need them and not where they don't. So I think that's like as a single uh, item, um, just uh, from an agricultural landscape perspective, our biggest source in the watershed, that's that's a key piece. And Josh, might I add to not just horizontally where we need them, but also vertically. We know that subsurface placement yes. is one of the best practices that we see out there across the landscape. Yes, and that's part that that gets tied into and flows from those nutrient management plans as well. Thanks, Josh. Anyone else on the panel? Restore a bunch of wetlands. <laughs> <laughs> Great point. But I will say, coming back to, to Heather's, there is no silver bullet. We know it's manure is playing a role. We know that old phosphorus, phosphorus that was applied 30 years ago before we knew how to appropriately apply nutrients. So this is a multi-pronged approach. So I love the question, but I wish there was one, one, one approach, one, one target. Where's Joe? He's lost. Oh, there he is. Craig Smith with WAMO and uh, retired from Ohio EPA. Um, I, I was hoping you could touch on some of the challenges you face dealing across the various levels of government and, and across the various industries and, and how you work to overcome those and build consensus on where we need to move. Um, I guess I'll offer a couple of thoughts first and see if anybody else wants to jump in. Um, I think, and this is something um, Teresa alluded to, one of the benefits we have in the Great Lakes region is the depth that people care for the resource and their connection to the resource. And so when you're trying to build consensus and deal with these complex issues, you always want to start with common ground where people can all agree. So we have this great uh, place to convene around and we all want to work towards restoring and protecting the Great Lakes. So if you start from that base that we're all trying to work from this place of common interest, um, that goes a long way. Uh, we spend a lot of time um, building relationships, just talking to people, convening. You hear me use the word convene a lot. So getting people in a room together to talk about what they're concerned about, what their perspectives are, what the challenges they face, um, and providing that space to share that information, and then looking for those opportunities, building connections across um, programs, so playing the connector. So you may not have the ability to, you know, implement this project here, but if I bring in this other agency or this other partner, they have additional flexibility and might be able to bring new resources or new ideas to the table. So um, those are just a few thoughts, but um, they are complex issues, but we have a common goal, and I think if we keep talking, keep convening relationships, and those opportunities and those areas of greater agreement start to emerge. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add one other fine point to everything that Erica just said, which I support holistically. Um, 
I think we need to ground ourselves more in the type of recommendations that we put forward. So when we're working with collaboratives or with a group of people to build consistency or con con consensus around a recommendation, um, I think we need to be working towards smart recommendations, those that are feasible, those that are measurable, so that we know if we're making progress, to your point, Teresa, um, those that are time bound, and that we have some confidence in interval around um, implementation, right? It's feasible on the ground. If it's not feasible on the ground, then we shouldn't be producing recommendations that will go nowhere. So I think building consensus, as long as we're working towards those ideas, concepts around smart recommendations, I think we will find ourselves in a greater level of one buy-in to success going forward. And I might just add, uh, we have two of the three commissions here. So we have the Great Lakes Commission and the International Joint Commission, but there is the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission. And, and you actually met recently, and there was a press release, that there is a new MOU between those three commissions to come back to that point of what lanes does everybody have in and where where do we want those lanes to actually overlap? There is that need for synergy, but also for folks to know what's their purview. And so that's really exciting. Yeah, and Chris, can I just add, it's really important for us to have amplification too, right? Um, the Great Lakes of all the watersheds that you saw is so exceptionally skilled at coming together, working together. Water is the tie that binds. It is bipartisan, it is the thing that everybody wants. Everybody wants their waters to be fishable, swimmable, drinkable, right? So um, the idea of this MOU working with the, the other commissions really does allow us to um, discuss, identify, build consensus around where the shared goals are in the region. Uh, I'm working at a multinational sort of scale with US and Canada and, and of course our indigenous communities on top of that. You know, Erica has states and provincial governments at the table. Fisheries commissions bring that natural resource practitioner and advocate to the table working on fisheries specific um, issues. It's a great opportunity for us to leverage those networks and to do just that, to build the consensus around the shared goals. And I would add to that as an example, um, you mentioned the productivity issue and reducing nutrients in the near shore without impacting detrimentally offshore productivity. And that's a really unique space for the three commissions because you have this issue that's impacting our ability to manage our fisheries to the goals that we want while also trying to meet our nutrient objectives in the near shore, which IJC and GLC are very involved in facilitating those practices. And then you added the added complexity of the interactions of invasive mussels in the near shore in Lake Erie and how that's impacting this complex problem. And so you bring these three commissions together and you have various expertise that addresses different aspects of this interrelated issue and you start to magnify and amplify um, our ability to solve those really complex problems. That's great, thank you. Joe, I think you're in the, oh, there we go. Uh, hi, I'm Deanne Jensen. I'm from the Maumee Watershed Alliance. It's a nonprofit based in Fort Wayne, Indiana at the headwaters of the Maumee. Um, speaking as a nonprofit um, within the agencies and the academia, um, there's a consensus among these smaller nonprofits where we don't have the capital as, say, TNC uh, to offer sponsorships and collaborations. What is your perspective on the role of smaller nonprofits within the overall goal of uh, restoring, maintaining, improving the Great Lakes watersheds? Fundamental. <laughs> um, it, you know, I think maybe the, the piece that I should highlight when it comes to wetland restoration in, in particular, um, our program could not happen without uh, the, the engagement of I think at this point, almost 80 different nonprofits or municipalities, NGOs that, that manage our projects. That, that's the only way that this work can get done. And I think like, like Teresa mentioned, you know, to build on that, um, the, these projects happen from, from the ground up, typically. And, and we, we need 
the engagement of, of uh, you know, folks who, who care about their watershed and, and want to see it uh, improved. Um, that's, that's where that work gets done. Yeah, I'm going to echo that quite a bit. Um, Healing Our Waters is, you know, a major partner with um, Glimpo. And so if you are you a member of Healing Our Waters? We'll chat. Um, it, it's, it's imperative. The, the small NGOs, the small community action groups, the small environmental justice groups, whatever it might be at the local level are the ones who know what's going on in their community way more than the states will ever know. You know, I'll put on my state hat for a moment. Yeah, I, I, need, I need to hear from you in order to be able to help move your needle, right? So your role is, is vital and critical to, to moving the needle for your community. So always be that voice. Um, and, and sometimes it'll feel, be, feel frustrating, I guarantee it. Um, but it, it isn't that people aren't hearing you. Sometimes it's like we, we need to figure out how to mesh you in. And, and so just keep pushing. And, and be part of that conversation, but it's critical. Um, whether, like I said, whether it's somebody working on, um, you know, a, a, a the headwaters of the Maumee, which thank you for doing that because that's not easy, or working in a community trying to get some climate work done um, on some flooding issues. You know, I, th I think of, you know, Southeast Michigan um, has massive flooding issues and needs about 4,000 more wetlands. Um, <laughs> plug for wetlands. Um, wetlands are huge, people like that. It is critical to the success of water qualities, having strong wetlands in the area. But working with those local communities and hearing their voice in there, we're not always going to be able to solve the problem, but we need to listen more. So going back to the question that was asked earlier on, on the collaboration and how do you work with those partners, it's we're not always going to agree on the topic or, or the discussion or the funding mechanism or the project, but keep pushing for your community. And just to, to add on to that, th this is something land-grant extension agents can help with, engaging the communities to the universities, but also sea grant agents. But I'd also say, if you don't, if you're not aware, many academics can't get grants anymore unless they have broader participation on the front end of that research project and broader implications on the back end. And so what our funding agencies have found is if we don't have the thoughts and the opinions of those local communities, that grant project's not going to be successful. And then also we have to deliver products on the back end that actually move that needle. So keep raising your hand and keep getting engaged. It's absolutely critically important. So time is running out for our morning session, which includes the live stream. So I want to make sure we get time for one more live stream question, and then we'll have one more question in the room. So Larry Antosh is with us online, and Larry asks, with our changing weather patterns, how do we move into watershed water management in addition to nutrient management? That's a, that's a good question, Larry, and I think that's something I, I maybe was a bit short-sighted when I jumped in and answered that question earlier, you know, that there isn't a silver bullet. Um, we do see some kind of core principles to flow forward from nutrient management to drive all of the other things we have uh, going on, but there is a bit of a paradigm that I think we need to recognize in that, you know, nutrient management and water management are essentially one and the same. Uh, we don't get nutrient loads leaving the landscape if water doesn't leave the landscape. That's how we start to see some of the wetland work become really essential in our, in our strategy to address uh, nutrients le leaving the landscape in, in uh, our rural watersheds. I would just second that and just say this is something the commission has started to talk about when we were in Washington, D.C. The other week, we had our um, some of our commissioners meet with our colleagues at USDA and RCS and start to talk about how some of those um, conservation pro programs can be leveraged and start to think about this broader integrated water management and deal with these increased flows and things like that in addition to just the nutrient management component. So this is something that we're definitely talking about within our commission. So there's also s multiple studies going on on climate resiliency and climate work and what, on how that works back in with nutrients, just, with, just that Glimpo is funding. Um, and I know there are thousands of more of those. But so much of this comes back to understanding you know, the sizing of systems, too, not just the runoff that's coming from, from farm fields um, or, or other areas, golf courses, things like that. But it's also important to be thinking about the overall infrastructure component of this too, whether it's in a municipality, whether it's stormwater, you know, you know, I keep stressing the wetlands, but it's true, the more wetlands you have, the more flood control you have, the more nutrient, you know, capture you have. 
working on a holistic approach. It, it isn't going to be this is the answer. It's, it's going to be these layered on approaches, not just one approach in one area. Even when we're talking about agriculture, we, we're probably going to need to look in certain areas for layered on BMPs, not just a BMP that's going out there. You, know, you can't just have a specific best management practice. You might need two or three for a site, depending on the site. So it's got to be thinking through the whole process, not just one piece at a time, but holistically for, for a site, but also for a community. You could argue there is no best management practice, right? They're management practices. It's got to be layered. Yeah, Josh, did you have one more, I think? But I think we're getting close to shutting down the online here. So I do, just to highlight a project funded uh, through GLRI, um, working with our Ohio Department of Agriculture in this space, is thinking about maybe just really changing how we think about water management on an ag field perspective and retaining some of that water uh, when we have a lot and using it later in the growing season when we don't. So we have some really good pilot projects going on in that space, and I wanted to highlight that one. I think it's going to be interesting. Hi, um, my name is Nicole Lopez. I'm Watershed Coordinator with Cuyahoga Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, and my question for you guys was, Teresa, I know you mentioned the Glempo grant for environmental justice, but aside from funding, advocacy, and the common goal to restore and protect water quality in the Great Lakes, how do you all keep each other accountable and collaborate to drive environmental justice efforts in the area? That is a great question. Uh, so a couple things. If you look at the former action plans, the Great Lakes Restoration, Restoration Initiative action plans, you didn't see a lot of conversation around climate or EJ. Last time we added a, a, a tribal page to it, we're getting there. Um, and as far as accountability, you know, I think we have this triennial assessment of progress that comes from the IJC and they report back to the federal agencies on how well we're doing. And you know, it's a good check for us. We listen to the comments, we, we, we digest them, but we're also looking back to the communities and, and ha trying to have those on the ground conversations. This is not um, normal for us, right? This is not what federal agencies have historically done. So we're still learning and we're, we're gonna trip. I guarantee it, we're not gonna be great and we're gonna keep working and so engaging with the local community is key to that conversation. But as far as accountability, one of the things that we're gonna be doing um, through the grants from, from Great Lakes National Program Office that we hand out or whether it's to our federal partners is there will be a required EJ component to, to the work that we're doing. Like how does this benefit the community, whether it's in you know a city or um, a, it was a term I heard yesterday, and I really liked it. It was, you know, non-traditional farming, um, or something along that line. And and I thought, wow, that's a great approach that I've never even thought about. How do we engage with folks who are not traditional farmers to to make sure we're meeting the needs of of them also? So. I don't have this perfect answer for you on this, and you guys are gonna hear me say that a lot, because if this were easy, we'd already have done it. Um, it's really trying to understand and communicate better, and, and then truly hold each other accountable. So I don't know, Heather, if you wanna talk a little bit about the TAP. Yeah, so absolutely, accountability, that is what the TAP is in, in, intended to do. I, I would say when it comes to EJ, the learning curve right now is pretty steep for all, all of us working in this space. Um, two important points. One is, I think it's really important for us to build a foundation of trust. And um, that is hard earned. It is long term. It is not a one off conversation. It is a continuing dialogue with communities that have been affected disproportionately for a very long time. So that comes with its own, <clears throat> excuse me, very heavy lift. And it needs to be genuine and heartfelt and continued. So that's my first point. My second point is um, all the funding in the world is wonderful to offer, but unless a community, an EJ community in this instance, feels like they actually have access, they understand the process, they can come up with match. We've tried to eliminate a lot of the match requirements and a lot of the EJ related work, which I think is a huge testament to we're learning, we're doing better. The goal here with accountability isn't to point the finger and say you did a bad job. It's to say, 
here are all the ways that we could be doing better. Let's work together to do better. So, you know, I, I think that trust component is super important. We have to start there. We have to start building relationships. Um, that is, again, not the easiest path for, for, for many of us who haven't worked in this space extensively and are learning. Um, but that second piece of identifying where the barriers are and looking to remove them. And match has been a, an easy sort of low-hanging fruit, easy to identify out of the gates. But my guess is, if you were to pose the same question to us 10 years from now, we would have very detailed and very different answers because we're just starting that hard work now in many cases. All right. Uh, thank you, Heather, Erica, Teresa, Josh, and Eric. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. I want to also thank Chris for moderating. Uh, one of the uh, uh, themes that I hear over and over in these types of panels, and, and it's really evident here, is this, this need for collaboration. Um, but one thing that I've, I've really noticed is, um, uh, as I said at the beginning, I've been working in this area for, for 20 some years, uh, looking at human natural systems and trying to understand the, how, how humans can interact with the environment in positive ways as opposed to negative ways. Um, but one of the things I've become really passionate about, and I know Chris mentioned this also, um, is the need for the science to get out to the communities and get out to the policymakers. And one of the things I'd really like to remind everybody is that it's incumbent on all of us to keep advocating for the science. Um, there's a lot of science that goes on here at the university. There's a lot of science that goes on in the School of Environment and Natural Resources. Um, and a lot of times that gets locked up in the ivory tower. And we need to be more aware of the fact that it's critical that the science get out there. Um, and it's partners like these that really help us get that science out there. So uh, please keep advocating for the science because there's good stuff going on at the university and the trust in that science is being eroded uh, and we really need to be uh, more aware of that. So um, as is our EPN tradition, we want to recognize each of you with a certificate of appreciation. Uh, Joe's going to help me here with uh, handing those out. Uh, and while Joe's handing those out, I'd also like to take a moment. Uh, a lot of times we see Joe running around here, and uh, you don't know everything that goes on behind the scenes. But I want to take a moment to just thank Joe for all of his work with the Environmental Professionals Network, because we often forget what happens, what go, goes into this. So. So thank you again to our panel. Um, we have an excellent in-person program continuing right here in this room uh, in about 15 minutes. Uh, so please refer to your agenda uh, in your program. Uh, Heather, Erica, Teresa, and Josh, uh, and Eric, uh, we each have additional time to dive deeper into the work of their respective agencies. And we'll have a few special guests join at the podium as well to share on their uh, work to restore Ohio's North Coast. I'm gonna skip some of these comments so that we can Get moving on things. Uh, but before we take a brief break, uh, I do want to encourage you to uh, learn more about our upcoming EPN events, uh, including a very special April event that's in the works. Uh, taking place on the evening of Earth Day, uh, Monday, April 22nd, we'll host in collaboration with the Chadwick Arboretum and Learning Gardens uh, and native plant enthusiasts from across the state, a one-of-a-kind feature, Eat This Earth Day. Uh, or maybe I should reemphasize that, Eat This Earth Day. Uh, the Fawcett Center at uh, Ohio State will be transformed for an evening-long series of interactive exhibits where you will eat and drink from Ohio's native plants, including the American pawpaw, sugar maple, and the low bush blueberry, as well as hybrid chestnuts, acorn flower, and many kinds of native shrub berries. Event uh, headliners, Nancy Linz, uh, leader of the uh, of two successful social and political movements to advance native plants at both the U.S. state and federal levels. Uh, our local celebrity and acclaimed author, uh, Deb Napke, uh, AKA the Garden Sage, who will share how to craft your garden for cultivating forage. And Brad Lepper, the senior archeologist uh, for the World Heritage Program at the Ohio History Connection, uh, will present on the food producing capacity of the ancient indigenous Hopewell culture. culture. Uh, this event's free and open to all. Uh, we'll feature extensive time to participate in interactive exhibits. Uh, including The Private Life of Bees with Dennis Ellsworth and to meet with dozens of native plant and culinary professionals staffing exhibits throughout the venue. 
Uh, and there'll be free, plant, uh, free native plant giveaways. So uh, please join us on April 22nd to celebrate the interconnectedness of native plants, wildlife, and people. Uh, reserve your spot for that program by signing up today following the details listed on the screen. A final program that I want to plug builds on today's extended conversation with ecological stewardship for Ohio's North Coast. On June 11th, the EPN will host a field trip to Stone Lab. Uh, this trip will feature a Lake Erie science cruise, including a fish trawl, plankton tow, other water quality research uh, experiences on the lake, a research facility tour um, of the wet lab, flex lab and mesocosm unit on the South Bass Island for conducting hab, fish and wildlife research, uh, as well as a tour of the educational facilities, natural and cultural histories of Gibraltar Island. Meals will be included and charter bus transportation options are available from Columbus. Alternatively, if you would like to provide your own transportation or if you live closer to the lake, then you're welcome to join us directly from the Miller Ferry on Catawba Island. Uh, register for our June 11th event today by following the details on the screen. So you don't miss out on any upcoming details and opportunities. We encourage you to become an EPM member today through a free and easy process at epn.osu.edu. Once an EPM member, you can post events, job openings, and receive announcements about forthcoming breakfast programs and other event happenings in our region. If you haven't already done so, uh, add your name to our list of over 2,300 EPN members to further connect, grow, and inspire with fe uh, fellow environmental professionals and enthusiasts in the months ahead. Please check out the list of environmental professionals uh, who have joined the EPN directory over the past five weeks. As we've alluded to earlier in the program and as outlined in the program agenda, we have an excellent continuing education program for our in-person audiences. This program uh, are open to all and we'll start again here in this room in about 10 minutes. Please talk to Joe if you have any logistical questions. While you're making your way out the door or clearing off your table, please help us return a reusable scarlet colored plate and cutlery toolkits with all pieces accounted for by scraping food off into the compost bin and returning these uh, reusable dining materials to the bins located near the exits. If you're unsure on where to place your plates and utensils, then no worries, simply leave them at your table and we'll take care of the rest. Thank you for joining us and have a nice remainder of your morning.